it's time for Coffee with the Chicken Ladies, a podcast for people who love chickens. Hey, everybody, and welcome. It's Chrissy and Holly from Coffee with the Chicken Ladies. We're here. This is episode number 154 of our podcast, where we talk about everything chicken, family, fun, and more chickens. More chickens. We drink a ton of coffee. I'm talking a ton. But most importantly, we hug chickens every day and we kiss them too. Don't forget, we brew coffee from a little coffee house in historic Gettysburg, PA. Phantom Coffee Roasters. Holly, and what kind of coffee are we brewing today? Today, we're doing some rich and delicious Colombian because I need an extra jolt for <laughs> sure. <laughs> So where can everybody get this delicious Colombian coffee? Bantamroasters.com. And don't forget, you can use our code FLUFFYBUTT for 10% off an order of anything on the website. That's an awesome code. It is. It's really good. And follow them on Facebook and Instagram. Are you ready to sip some of this amazing coffee and chat? I am. But first, a word from our sponsor. We have some exciting news to share from our sponsor, Grubly Farms. They're here, new and improved, Grubly's World Harvest. I'm a longtime subscriber, and my flock love the healthy, nutritious treats, plus orders $40 or more ship free. If you haven't heard, Grubly's has a fantastic layer pellet and crumble feed. It's packed with plant and insect protein, perfect for those picky chickens and ducks. Grubly Farms makes food and treats for healthy pets and planet. To support us and Grubly's, go to our website or our show notes and use the link. Try it today. So how are you doing today? I am doing okay. You maybe are not doing so well. I now have Sophia's cold. So I have been under the weather for the last few days. And my voice is coming back, but it was completely gone. So here we are. So we're recording via Zoom because I am not sitting in the house of illness. No, because you don't want to get sick before we go. Exactly right. So I hope you're feeling better very soon. Drink lots of liquids and hot soup and stuff. Oh, yeah, because I need my voice. It's very important. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. So McMurray Hatchery has just opened for pre-orders for next year's chicks. And you're already thinking about what you want when we said the inn is full, but we're thinking of getting new chicks. Well, Uh, how's this going to happen? Well, what's going to happen is that I wanted ducks and I don't think we can do it this year because we just don't have the time to build a run. We we just don't. We're that busy. So I went back and looked through my list of birds that I really, really want. And I've come up with a few. Have you? I've thought about it. If I do get any, I'll probably just get three chicks to add Uh to my big run because I have more than enough room in there in the coops and in the space. So Yes, but I don't think we should give our breeds just yet. I think we should think about it some more. That's fine. Are you considering a new breed, a new to me breed? I'm also considering a new to me breed. Yes, definitely. Well, we'll see how that goes. For sure. (laughs) You're going to be like, I want this one and this one and this one and this one. I've already done it, but we're doing three, four max this year. So, yeah. It's hard when you have geriatric or adult flocks that are existing and they're doing well, right? it's very difficult to, well, it's not difficult. You don't want to upset the apple cart. It's very time consuming to do the integration the right way so that you don't upset your geriatric girls or your older girls and so that the babies don't get picked on so badly. Now, I will say this, my integration took me longer this year, but it went very smoothly. Ours so did too. Ours did too. I took my time. I did not rush it. I did not say, okay, by this month, they're going to be in there. I went the pace that I wanted to. They're smaller chickens. The big girls are bigger. So they waited a little longer. And when we finally put them together, it was seamless. There were no fights. There were no problems. We had some minor chasing. We still have you know, occasional bops on the head from Pansy, the Swedish flower, or Dolly, the Dominique, but nothing serious. No fights. It has gone very, very well. I love seeing those babies in there at night. And here is the best thing. So our big girls, the geriatric run, they go in earlier than the other girls. Yeah, they do. They're like, look, it's getting dark. It's bedtime. We're going in. So at first, you know, the babies didn't want to go in. We had to come put them in. 
that lasted like three, four days. Right. Now the babies go in with the big girls early. <laughs> okay. So they're on the big girl schedule. And you open Perfect. up the coop and all the babies are together, like sitting there like, okay, we're ready for bed. That's cute. And the big girls are up top on the roost. So it's just so cute. And it's... It is. I'm just glad that I took my time. And that's the key that we say to everyone. Don't put pressure on yourself to fit into what you think should be the right way to do it. Yeah. If it takes a little longer, that's okay. We got super lucky this year. We had to put the babies in, like physically lift them into the coop one time. The next night, one of the cogens was like, no, I'm going in with everyone else. And once Mm -hmm. she started going in, they followed her. So we got very lucky with that because cogens like to be comfortable. Oh, yeah. I mean, I've had years like that. I think a few years ago, I put them in one time and they were, everybody was great. Perfect. You get lucky sometimes and other times you're going to be a little bit more careful with who you introduce, how you do it. So yeah, it's one of those tough things. But that leaves us on this note. If you're listening to our show and you're loving it, head on over to Apple Podcast and leave us a written review. It does amazing things for the growth of our show. And while you're there, hit that subscribe button. It helps us grow and you will never, ever miss an episode. If you're looking for other ways to support the podcast, you can share your favorite episodes on social media. You can tell some chicken loving friends about the podcast. You can visit our Etsy shop. Check out the things we have there. You can become a patron of the show, patreon.com slash coffee with the chicken ladies. Welcome to all of our newest patrons. Thank you to all of our patrons. And the other thing you can do to help support the show is use our affiliate links and discount codes and buy products from our sponsors. Yay! Hey, Chris. Yeah. Do you like subscription boxes? Does it have anything to do with chickens? Of course. Then yeah. Let me take a minute to tell you about the Chicken Love Box. If you love goodies for your chickens and you, you need to go to chickenlove.com. I love the Mega Box. Tons of useful products for my flock and a chicken tea for me. You can't go wrong with a chicken tea. They are so cute and so soft. In the August box, I absolutely love those amazingly good smelling nest box herbs and that giant roll of rooster stickers. They're great. I love the wood decorative plate. It's going up in our studio today. And with all my baking, those egg separators are going to work awesomely. Boxes start at $39 a month. They ship immediately after your order and shipping is always free. Such a great deal. Don't wait. Get off the nest and click already. Use the code CWTCL50 for 50% off your first box of a three-month subscription or more. That's chickenlove.com. That's chickenluv.com. Get your subscription today. Have you heard of Strong Animals Chicken Essentials? They make natural supplements for your flock. Strong Animals has used plant-based products and natural approaches to promote the health and vitality of backyard flocks. Their products contain organic essential oils, prebiotics, and other natural ingredients to support the immune system and digestive health. Give your chicks and chickens what they need to thrive with Strong Animals health products. Visit GetStrongAnimals.com today. The Breed Spotlight is brought to you by Murray McMurray Hatchery, defining quality for generations. For over a century, Murray McMurray Hatchery has remained a trusted family-owned business, working tirelessly to ensure our poultry meet the highest standards. Whether you are an experienced enthusiast or just embarking on the journey, look to McMurray Hatchery for guaranteed quality rare and heritage breeds, low minimums, and all the supplies you need to raise your flock. Request a free catalog today. Time for the Breed Spotlight. Yeah. Yeah. This week's Breed Spotlight is the Seabright, Ella's favorite chicken. Well, they are gorgeous little bantams. I mean, they're very, very pretty birds. The beautiful Seabright is a true bantam. They were developed in England in the late 1790s through the early 1800s. Oh, yeah. They're tiny birds with gorgeous lace feathers and big dark eyes. Once you see a Seabright, I feel like you will never forget it. Oh, yeah. They're different. They're a little bird that's different. Yeah. Now, they are a rare heritage breed. They are currently listed in the watch category of the conservation priority list. Better than some birds. Definitely better than some birds. And you will find that they are reasonably popular show birds. Which we will be seeing. Sir John Saunders Seabright 
seventh baronet, is generally credited with the creation of this breed. Oh, he's got a long name. Yeah, he does. It, it's even longer. I left a lot of it off. Wow. Now, right? So 1790s through the early 1800s, this is an interesting time in England. There's a lot of emphasis on agricultural developments. There's a lot of change and even some unrest in the rural areas. Oh, no. Oh, yeah. The time period when Seabright began working on this breed fell right after the American Revolution. The Prince Regent, who was later George IV, had taken over the throne from his father, George III, who was commonly known as Farmer George and the Mad King. Oh, man. Yeah, he must have had a psychotic break. He was in bad shape. They called him Farmer George because (laughs) agriculture was his enduring passion. So the Prince Regent took over from his father. He was very different from his father. He was very fashionable. He was not super interested in agricultural things. Jane Austen lovers and Bridgerton fans will know a few things about this time period. It kind of sets the stage for them. As far as poultry goes, Seabright was more than a bit ahead of his time with developing a breed in the way he did. Most of the older breeds were regional, you know, like the Dorking, the Sussex. They were usually attached to an area. Exactly. And Seabright was novel in that he was breeding for a specific appearance. And he, as a wealthy man, he had the resources to gather the foundation breeds that he wanted to work with. He also he had, had the mula. He did. Yeah. And he had the time to put into this project. Now, the end result, the Seabright was not a practical chicken that would have been kept by the common people. This was essentially a fancy bird for the gentry. This is the one I see myself carrying around. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I've not been able to delve into this very deeply, but I've seen here and there people say that before Queen Victoria came on the scene with her coach in China's and her melees, if you were an upper class woman, the only birds really it was permissible for you to work with were bantams. The big breeds were seen as less than genteel. Like the country farmer's wife might be out in the backyard with her geese and her right speckled Sussex, but if you were gentry, the Seabright was one of your only options. It was a dainty bird for the dainty women. I guess so, which is ridiculous, but whatever. It is what it is. Totally ridiculous. So so it took somewhere between 20 and 30 years for Sir John to develop these birds to his satisfaction. I mean, that's a long time to be sitting here and like 20 to 30 different. I mean, how many times genetically did you change it to get what you wanted? I mean, that's crazy. 20 to 30 years. Right. You don't have much going on at that point in your life. I mean, come on. Well, what he was chasing was the lacing. He wanted the lacing perfect. He, you know, he had a vision. It had to be exactly as he wanted it. Contemporary sources speculate that the Nankin and the Hamburg were very likely as foundation breeds. Also, perhaps rose cone bantams and some of the small game birds of the time. Oh, yeah. You could definitely see those birds. In more than one source... We read that apparently Sir John had a lot of help with this project, but he gets all the credit, of course. Because he had the mula. That's I right. Mean, that's why he gets the credit. That's right. The general consensus of Sir John's peers seems to be that he was a difficult man. Now, in government and social circles, Seabright sat in Parliament as a member of the House of Lords, and he, he was active in government circles. So in government and social circles, he was known as grouchy, opinionated, vain, and more than a little fond of the sound of his own voice. That does not sound like a nice person. I, that's kind of ouchy, right? Ooh. It sounds like but Oscar the Grouch. It kind of does. But this is also apparent. He was very intelligent and he was nobody's fool. He did a lot of writing and he did a lot of other agricultural experiments, including, I know he did some cattle breeding, and I want to say he did pigeons or dove breeding as well. I think I saw that somewhere too. Okay. So his writings and his various experiments had a strong influence on the work of Charles Darwin, believe it or not. Wow. Yeah. The American Poultry Association Standard of Perfection notes that Sir John founded the first specialty breed club, the Seabright Bantam Club, in 1815. So they were the first chicken club of all were the Seabrights. Yes. So the Seabright Bantam Club is still in existence in the UK, and it is probably one of the oldest, if not the oldest breed club in the world. Wow. Yeah. 
There is a Seabright Club of America as well. Now, I was unable to find exactly when Seabrights showed up in the U.S., but they were included in the first printing of the APA Standard of Perfection in 1874. Okay, so they've been here a long, long time. Yes. Now, let's look into what they actually look like, because everybody wants to know this. Besides the big, beautiful, dark eyes, they're stunningly beautiful birds, okay, with either silver or gold laced feathers. Laced feathers are absolutely gorgeous. You can't go wrong with lacing on feathers. Stunning is the right word. They're just, they have a great look. It's beautiful. Now they do have the rose comb. And like I said, those large dark eyes and lead blue legs. So the blue legs are really cool. Mm -hmm. And that may be from the Nankins or the Hamburgs, one or the other. Right. So the males are hen feathered, which is different than most. Yes. So note this. The males are not going to be feathered differently than the hens. They're hen feathered. So it's something that when you want to look for different feathering, you're not going to say it. While they're bigger than the females, they also have bigger combs and waddles. So you can see a difference there. Now, like I said, they have no hackle saddle wingbow or sickle tail feathers. They are going to look hen feathered. This is really different than a lot of different birds. Yeah. yeah. That's why I'm kind of sticking on it for a minute, because when you think about it, roosters and hens, one of the main differences when you see them are their feathers. Right. I mean, if you're trying to sex an adolescent chicken, you're looking right at the hackle and saddle feathers. Do they have these? The wingbow feathers and then the sickle tail feathers, like That's one of the glorious things about the rooster tail, those long sickle feathers. Right. And like the nankin, these birds are tiny. They are very small. And the U.S. standard calls for about 32 ounces. If you think about it, 32 ounces would be two pounds. And they're coming in at 22 at the tops. Right. Right. So they're smaller than two pounds. very small birds. Yeah. Very, very, very. So they're tiny. They're bantams. You can get a quite a few of them in where if you have a smaller space, that would be great. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the hens are not the best layers, unlike the Hamburgs and the Nankins. How can that be with those two foundation breeds? I don't know. We don't really know exactly what the foundation breeds are. This is, These are just really good guesses. It's also possible that there's something else mixed in there that was just... I know we don't like this word, but I'm using it in a historical context. They may have used a more ornamental breed that wasn't a good layer in there. Or perhaps the rigors of breeding this bird down to its appearance robbed them of the genetics that were required to be really good layers. Exactly, because we're looking at 60 to 80 small cream colored eggs per year. Yeah. That is not a good layer at all. 60 to 80 per year. In general, bantams in general aren't great layers. The nankins are really an exception to that rule. Nankin hens lay very well. They do. And I mean, the Hamburgs are really close in there too, and they are phenomenal layers. So, I mean, 60 to 80 is such a small amount. Now, I'm going to give you another thing that's going to shock everybody. It's very unusual. These hens do not go broody. Bantams are known for being broody monsters. Yeah. I mean, there are always exceptions to this. You know, probably in every batch, you'll have a couple that go broody. But on average, they're just not broody hens. They're not. Now, what did you see with the hens, the featherness of the males affects their hormones? And Yeah, I saw some speculation. Like, we'll talk about this in a second. But essentially, these birds are hard to breed. It's hard to get them to breed. And some of that could be, again, this is complete speculation, but I saw it in more than one place. Speculation that because the males are hen feathered, that probably has affected their hormones. I mean, their hormones are responsible for all those male feathers. Right. So if they don't have the same breeding hormones that, you know, the rest of the roosters in the world do, it might make them less fertile. Maybe. Like in a rough theory, it makes sense. I don't know if there's any science to back it up. If it's just a guess, whatever. But I thought it was worth at least mentioning. I mean, look at this. It took this man 20 to 30 years to make the breed the way he wanted to. But it's so utterly different than other bantams right. in the same category right. that he did some major swizzling with genetics to make. And what he wanted was very different 
than what a normal bantam shows even today. Right. So, I mean, he really wanted something different. So if you do get the Seabright, know that the conventional things that you think of bantam chickens are not there. They're not there. This bird was created for zero practical purpose other than being beautiful. That's the main purpose of this bird is to Mm -hmm. look beautiful. Yep. It wasn't egg laying ability. It wasn't broodiness. He bred out all of what makes bantams bantams. Right. And just made a very tiny, pretty bird in the place of it. And I don't know. He might have done this bird a disservice, to be honest with you. I mean, you know, it's hard to say. One, I've never had them. But two, like, on one hand, do we demand too much from chickens? Like, you know, we want everything to be excellent layers and we want everything to be this or that. On the other hand, like, are we doing a disservice by keeping breeds going that? My question is, midway through in the 15th year, did he have a really nice, good bird that he pushed further and further along what? and stripped of some of the really like did he have aesthetically a really beautiful bird at that point and he really wanted to go further and he took all the things that make a bantam a bantam out you know so at what point his, did he push it too far his drive his overarching drive was the lacing that was it he was after as near perfect lacing as he could get that was his yeah. overarching drive that was it so my question is, at what point was the lacing uh-huh. absolutely gorgeous, but it wasn't perfect for him that he pushed further, you know? and that- yeah, Because the only people that wrote about this were people who were also interested in breeding for looks and show. So, you know, it's hard, exactly. to, it's hard to know. So-, so we'll see this bird at the show next week, and I'm going to look at it differently at this point, and I'm going to look closely at this lacing and uh-huh. see what makes it so different than birds who are naturally laced and look just as beautiful like to me it's like I a perfectionist bird, yeah. i don't know that any bird is naturally laced i mean i think that that was definitely breeding manipulation to get to the lacing right yeah what you're saying is is there a point at which it's more harmful to keep breeding for looks and breeding out practical attributes exactly what i'm saying yeah. yes now for a bunch of reasons many of which we just stated seabrights are not always the best birds for beginners while they are fairly heat hardy, they do not fare well in cold and they will need protection from winter weather. They're tiny. They're less than two pounds. So, yes, they're going to need some assistance. They don't have that big fluff and big extra body fat on them right, to keep right. them warm. As we mentioned, they can be quite difficult to breed and they're also rather susceptible to Merrick's disease. So if you do get them and you go to any breeder, we want you to make sure that these birds that you bring into your flock are vaccinated for Merrick's disease. Yeah. Yeah. They are active little birds and they're great for showing. They're great for keeping, you know, in a a beautiful chicken ladies or chicken gents mixed bantam flock. I saw in a couple places that they can be aggressive because they have game bird bred into mm-hmm. them. I couldn't substantiate this, but again, I'm mentioning it. While they're not described as a skittish bird, we did see several keepers who say that they rarely stay still and they're not really cuddly, though some did still find them to be friendly little birds. Oh, yeah. I mean, I can see that because what I think has happened is someone took their perfectionism for lacing to the utmost point and bred out probably everything that made this bird great in other ways, you know, so I can see that. Right, right. This is literally the product of breeding for looks alone. That's it. That's That's it. That's That's it. So where can you get them? Well, yeah, yeah, our favorite hatchery has them. McMurray carries both colors of Seabright as straight run chicks, so silver laced and gold laced, but they are straight run. They need some help. They're in the watch. So we're not saying not to get Seabrights. What we're saying is you're going to need to be experienced with these little chickens because they will need some extra care. It's kind of like the other day we got a message from someone who had lovely breeds that they had picked in their beginning, and they had also listed Houdans on. And I think that Houdans are not always a beginner's chicken because they do need a little bit of extra grooming. They need a little extra care. They're very small bodied. You have to make sure they're warm in the winter. But if you're ready for all those things, then that's fine. And the personality takes you, I mean, is phenomenal. Like one of the 
friendliest chickens I've ever seen in my life. So the yeah, the Houdans. But some birds need extra care. The things with the Merricks and everything else. You don't want to be a beginner and get this chicken and I go to a breeder like- that doesn't vaccinate. And then all of a sudden you're presented with Merricks and you say, what in the world have I got myself into? You can make sure you buy your Seabrights from an NPIP breeder, but that still does not guarantee that your bird won't encounter Merricks someplace else. That's the danger. The other thing about these birds that really requires extra care is that big rose comb. Oh, yeah. They're closer to the head. So some people say they're more, they're safer in cold weather than straight combs. I think they're all in danger because it's literally just, you know, tissue sticking up from the head. So you really have got to watch that rose comb too. Yeah, I agree. They're not for beginners. You might want to get a few years under your belt before you do this. Beautiful birds though. Beautiful birds. They are beautiful. They're (laughs) gorgeous. (laughs) Okay, so if you have Seabrights, if you love Seabrights and you have them, we want to see your pictures. Mention us in your story on Facebook or Instagram, and we will reshare it. We want to see your chickens for sure. If you're looking for a chicken coop that's produced in a planet-friendly, sustainable way, try Nestera. Each coop is made from highly durable, 100% recycled plastic that keeps the equivalent of up to 2,000 shampoo bottles out of a landfill. Their clean, modern design will fit into any garden or run area and comes with an industry-beating 25-year warranty and a range of handy accessories. Simple to put together, so quick and easy to clean, and most importantly, red mite resistant. Your chickens will love it. Quick shipping from nestera.us. For a 5% discount, use the affiliate link in our show notes, on our website, and on Instagram. Link in bio. Check them out today. Roosties proudly sponsors Coffee with the Chicken Ladies. They're back with an innovative new product. You're going to want to check this out. It's an extra large set, a 14-pound feeder and three-gallon water with steep anti-roost lids. They're made of super durable material. You can either stand them on legs or hang them on brackets on your coop or fence. They're easy to remove and clean too. Plus, they look awesome. We personally use Roosties and we're huge fans. So if you're raising chicks or keeping chickens, check out the Roostie store on Amazon or follow the link in our show notes. Okay, so are we ready to move on to... Main topic. Yeah. 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 Okay, everyone. This week, we have a very special guest. Stephanie Coomer is joining us. She is the chair for marketing and advertising for the American Poultry Association. Stephanie, you also run the social media. You are a longtime breeder of some gorgeous chickens, and you're an avid chicken art collector. Welcome to the show. Hey, Stephanie. Thank you very welcome. much. Thank you. It's, it's good to be here. She seems like she's a perfect match for our show. I'd say so. I would say (laughs) so. I'm a crazy chicken lady. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) I was going to say, as you're reading everything, I'm like, yes, check, check, (laughs) check. We go on and welcome. You know, it's great. So please tell the listeners a little bit about yourself and a lot about your chickens. Okay. Well, I didn't grow up with chickens. 2014, my late husband basically begged me to get chickens for some breakfast. And I didn't want chickens. And then I fell in love with chickens. <laughs> and in the spirit of being very competitive, coming from a background showing horses, in 2016, I went to a chicken show and I looked at him and I said, this is what I'm doing. <laughs> so in 2016 began my love of standard bread and exhibition poultry. I have raised Orpingtons since 2014. I raise all large fowl, so no Bantam chickens here. So large black Orpingtons and then a non-approved color, which is self-blue, which your listeners will know as lavenders. They were my first love and what got me into making poultry better, so to speak. Mm -hmm. I got the blacks to help fix them, fell in love with the color black. In 2016, I acquired black and blue large fowl cochin. Mm. So I've been breeding large cochin since 2016. And then in 2021, I took on a very special project, uh, reviving life back into the large black Wyandots, which is a breed variety that you hardly ever see. So I'm very proud to be one of less than a handful of breeders actually working on those. I am a master exhibitor in the APA. I am a grand master exhibitor of large black cochins. And I just found out that I'm now a grand master exhibitor in large black Orpingtons as well. So I have wow. uh, a lot of experience. I travel all over the country showing chickens, much like you ladies. My best friend and I literally go everywhere. 
in January, we flew chickens to California for a show. That's how dedicated to poultry showing an exhibition I am and she is as well. And we just imported chickens into Canada for the 150th Canadian National last weekend so that we could exhibit our birds there. You are hardcore. We love yeah. it. <laughs> and also, you have exquisite tastes in chicken. You like the big fluffies yeah. like we do. Mm-hmm. I like so, large birds. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah, we do too. An armful to hug. Also, I'm enthralled with black chickens. What is it about black chickens that draws you in? I don't know. Like I always tell people when I showed horses, I always ended up with horses that were primarily white. And it always frustrated me to keep them clean. So yeah. black was very, very appealing. But to me, there's something special about a black bird when it's done completely right. When it's when it's perfect with the green sheen and the feathers, it's in the contrast between the red and the comb and the wattles. It's just such a stunning amazing thing for me at least to look at like a lot of people are patterned people I raise blues you know blues are patterned and I love that plat pattern but I am just in love with black the black is stunning I got for the first time ever this spring I got a black langshin and uh-huh. she is the most stunning bird and also another black coach and who is if I do say so myself probably good enough to show well that oh, was good. luck that yeah. was luck is something about the green sheen. I talk oh, yeah. about it all the time on the show is even with chickens who have black feathers mixed in, they always have that green sheen. There is something special mm-hmm. about when the sun hits your chicken in a certain light and it picks that up. It is very special. There's so a- I can imagine mm-hmm. an all black bird being, you know, beyond that when the sun hits in the certain direction. I mean, they're so elegant. They're just, they are. They're just very special. Clearly, we're on the same page with you when it comes to black chickens. <laughs> Pardon me. And traveling, you know, all around the country to show chickens, that sounds like so much fun. Yeah. <laughs> it's crazy. Uh, we do like 19 or so shows a year. Like, we'll be in Ohio coming up. And then, like, three days later, we turn around and go to Nebraska. We'll be in mm-hmm. Oklahoma. We'll be in Tennessee. In January, we'll be in Massachusetts to Florida to Georgia. I mean, we literally go all over the place. If there's a show that we're interested in, we make time for it. And with my work with the APA, I run a lot of our videos, a lot of our lives on our social media. So if any of your followers follow the American Poultry Association on Facebook or Instagram, you're probably familiar with my face because I am constantly doing content for them. And we can link that in our show notes so that everyone can go and watch. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask the next question, and it's a little bit more technical, but it is something that I believe all of our listeners may need to be, you know, just touched up on because sometimes we don't always know. So my question is, what is the APA and what do they do? Why should listeners want to join? So the American Poultry Association is the oldest livestock organization in the country. We're older than any of your cattle, you know, your horse organizations, any other livestock. We're the oldest one in the country. So we were founded in 1873. The the goal of the APA is to promote show and exhibition poultry, standard bred poultry, and to protect those poultry shows to keep those breeds going. And while on top of that, we're promoting these breeds, we're producing the American standard of perfection, which is the book that we produce. You mentioned the new one that's going to be coming out this year. We've been producing it since 1874. And essentially what the standard of perfection is that it's a guide to what every breed that's approved by our organization is supposed to be. All of your basics down to the bird's weight, the feather, the color of the feather, the color of their eyes, the width of the feather on the bird, the color of the legs, the color of the egg that it's supposed to lay. All of those things are outlined in the standard, and we uphold that standard to help continue these breeds and keep them moving forward. We also promote our juniors and try to encourage and keep our juniors involved in poultry into adulthood as well as offering a ton of benefits for our members. One of them, I actually brought the newest copy. This is our yearbook for the historic year, the 150th. These just came out. I Like you mentioned, I'm also a designer for them. But in this book, you get it free every year with your membership. It's a beautiful, glossy, full color and black and white book. 
that has not only articles from our prestigious members, breeders, judges, it has advertisements for almost everybody in poultry. If they, they want to be anywhere, they're going to be in here. So when you're looking for a specific breed, this is going to be a good place to look. You can also look up those farms that you're looking at and see how many breeder points they have. If they're a master exhibitor, um, who your Hall of Fame guys are all kinds of stuff. So this is a really good perk as well as collecting points within the organization if you decide to get into showing your poultry. And our amazing points chair, who is our president also, Norma Padgett, sends out beautiful ribbons and pins with your class wins at our meets. And then this year, of course, they're giving out an amazing array of crystal for some of our awards. And if you guys would like to see one, I won one in California. I would be happy to show you. Oh, we love it. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Give me one second. I'll grab Sure. So for our champion largefowl, champion bantam, and champion waterfowl, and turkey, and reserves, uh, and guinea, you're going to receive one of these crystal boxes. I hope you guys can see that. Oh, that's Look beautiful. At that. And these are provided by the APA. Ooh. Very as a part of the celebration for that 150th, they're also giving away some very large crystal uh, vases for our show champion and reserve. Beautiful. So. The, the organization does a lot for its members and has a lot of material online. There's old standards you can look at when you're a member, all kinds of stuff. Oh, we're members. And I will say that even though I've never shown a chicken, that yearbook is like my morning coffee best friend. You know, I sit down <laughs> with my coffee and I page through that and look at gorgeous birds and it's just wonderful. Oh, yes. It is personally because i'm so involved in the yearbook it's my pride and joy and this year was so so important and so special it really was a beautiful addition and even if you join today you're still going to get this year's copy so you get that copy anytime you join in the year even if we've already produced it and put it out yeah nice. and it's 25 dollars for mm -hmm. membership i belong to a lot of livestock organizations 25 dollars mm -hmm. is pretty good yeah honestly that it is really is good yeah and you can do longer memberships. We also have like a life membership that you can get. The other thing I always tell people to watch, we don't do it every year, but sometimes around Christmas, we do a three-year membership package with a standard. And it used to be around $100, but I know with the cost of living going up that it'll probably be a little bit more than that. But you get the book and three years of membership when we run that sale. So that's great. Yeah, that's nice. nice. I can't wait to see the new standard. Holly's over here drooling over the new standard. She's I, like, when we get there, I cannot wait to get it. <laughs> so I actually was chosen as the designer for the cover. So the artwork that's on the cover is my artwork. It was a very proud moment for me. Wow. Oh, congratulations. That's, that's amazing. Awesome. Yeah. Congrats. Yeah, this, is, uh, this year's book is so important because it's the 150th year. It's historic year for the organization. Oh, yeah. I, let's. We talk all the time about ladies back in history, right? Going and taking their their poultry to the show and the proud moment. And I always say, I feel like maybe I was back there because I have like you know this feeling like it was so prominent. You know, like walking <laughs> with your chickens going your previous in previous life, my previous life. Well, you would have been a Victorian about, lady. I would have been with a bustle. Oh. I would have had a big bustle. You know it. I can't speak for other countries, but I can tell you women and children weren't permitted in poultry shows until I want to say the 60s. So that's I wasn't a big, there. <laughs> it's oh, a big thing. Them. So like it's a running joke right now because for our 150th year, everybody was kind of talking about dressing in period wear for, for the event. Some of our older judges were like, oh, so that means the women can't attend. Like <laughs> So it's Just, it's very interesting, but now it's such a there's so many women in the hobby and uh, kids are everywhere. Every show yeah. has a junior show. Not everyone, but pretty much all of them have a junior show. And it, it's such a family environment and very welcoming environment. But in the beginning, it was a, a man's sport, so to speak. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> so the first two, I guess it was as the first two shows in Boston before the APA was formed. Mm -hmm. women and children could get in there for free. But then once okay. the APA was formed, that was the end of it. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> ladies couldn't show anywhere because ladies so couldn't show. Or you, maybe you were a Brit. I, I, somewhere. You could have been well, showing. Like Queen Elizabeth Palace. was a huge, like a huge poultry exactly. person. Yeah, so. Exactly. Is Norma Paget the first female president of the APA? She is not. Vi Hallbach was the first one. Norma is the second. And Vi's son... 
is one of our most prominent judges, Jeff Halbach, and he's still in in the fancy. He'll be judging at Ohio this year. Nice. Okay. So yeah, no period dress for you. Oh man, no, I'm still going to dress in a period <laughs> with dress your, with your bustle. You'll you be doing it. There's going to be a next. lot of people. <laughs> people dressing up anyway. Yeah, yeah. The colonial yeah. woman chicken dress. I'm Amazon, seen, like, get that. Are you guys coming to our banquet? No, the banquet was sold out before we even knew about it. Okay. <laughs> well, there there are people scalping tickets online, just so you're aware. <laughs> okay. Well, let's go back a little bit to the history. So the APA sure. does have this long history in the U.S. Mm-hmm. This is the 150th anniversary. So what does that mean? What What is the APA doing for this anniversary? So obviously being the long, the oldest livestock organization in the country, it's, it's a big deal to us. 150 years is like, that's a really long time, 1873. Mm-hmm. So of course we're coming out with the brand new standard. It will be at Ohio. You can go ahead and pre-order it online on our, on our store. I do recommend you do that in case they happen to sell out and pre-order. I don't believe they are. I haven't gotten that communication. So they're coming out with that. Of course, we did a very special edition this year for the yearbook. We're we're having this huge, huge show. 10,600 birds are, have been entered in the show. That is at, in Columbus, Ohio at the Ohio State Fairgrounds. This show is going to be every breeder from all over the country. We have people driving from California. We have people coming from Texas, Florida, all the way up to New England. I mean, breeders from all over the country have been planning for this for years to make sure that their birds were ready. So the very best birds we probably have seen in a long time are going to be at Ohio. Not that we don't always have amazing birds there, but these these people have been working specifically for this show. We even have Canadian exhibitors coming across the border to be able to show at this. So North America is really coming out for this event we actually had so many entries they had to turn some away and it happened very quickly as well so the apa is hosting this event with the the ohio national club that is in ohio who runs the show and we are hosting this event it's a three-day event which most of your poultry shows start around friday afternoon and end by sunday morning This one's starting first thing Thursday morning and awards will be on Sunday. So we have three full days of poultry showing going on, which has happened in history, but not very often. So this is kind of like a lot of people's vacation. Like this is a whole thing. We have poultry breeders who aren't even showing that are coming just to be a part of this event because of how momentous it is. And then of course the banquet, the banquet on Saturday night is something that I have worked very closely with Norma on. We have... Over 550 tickets sold for this banquet. The APA will be doing some very special activities, some very special recognitions, um, some giveaways, a lot of really cool things for our members to show the appreciation for the membership, for attending the event, and just overall being a part of the organization. So it's just kind of a celebratory year for us. And as you've seen, the awards that they're giving out, which is not something that they do every year. These were very special awards selected for this year. Now they do their ribbons and their pins and certificates and things like that. But those crystal awards were very specific for this year. And they're gorgeous. That's so beautiful. Side note here. Are there any new chickens added into the standard of perfection that we We might... We do have some new ones. I'm trying to recall off the top of my head because I'm not on that committee, but I do believe... We have some new varieties of Muscovy that were admitted, uh, some new varieties of the Sarama that were admitted. I don't think we have a new breed per se, but varieties varieties. Were admitted. Varieties were admitted. So I would actually have to look that up. Um, if you want me to, I can. No, um, I was just curious. But, yep. We have some changes that have, we actually had a whole revision this year on the standard. The committee went through and revised a bunch of things in the standard. So there's a lot of different and new information that'll be in nice. this year's book. There we go. There was I know an email went out about it because I remember <laughs> reading it. Let me see. Is the buff African a goose or a duck? Yep. Buff African geese. Yep. And silver Muscovy. Silver Muscovies, yep. The Black Morans. Yep, the Black Morans were. Yep, they were admitted. Black breasted red phoenix. Wow. Okay. Yep. That's probably gorgeous. Self Self Americanas. Americanas. Yep. I was actually at the meet where they got approved. New colors of bantams. Yes. Okay. Oh, yeah. Look at that one. Bearded self blue silky bantam, ginger yep. red modern game, black breasted red rose comb, mm-hmm. buff Colombian cochin, and lemon mm-hmm. blue cochin. 
Oh, that lemon blue coach and bantam. Oh, she's <laughs> oh, adorable. <my> bird. <laughs> She is adorable. And I'm sure a lot of those varieties will be at the show if somebody would like to see them in person. That sounds amazing. Oh, yeah. Here's the, there's a whole long list there. <laughs> yeah, you put a, a lot of new color varieties in. Wow. Yeah, there was a lot of work in this standard. There was actually some things that had been left out of standards that was in before and a lot of like uh, wording changes. And there was a lot of work on the the part of Don Barger and his committee, which is the, the standard committee, to make sure that this standard was complete, correct, and the best one that it could be. We, I really look forward to seeing it. Yeah. How often <laughs> is the standard changed and updated? It's ever it changes. So like it's there's not like a specific amount of years, but I would say usually every four to six or seven years we're we're trying to come out with a new one. The 45th edition was 2014. So it's been about it's been nine years. Oh, okay. So or the 44th edition. This is the 45th edition. This is the out. 45th edition. Okay. Yes. Nice. I'm making myself a note to go buy this. <laughs> yes. When we yeah, finish do it because interview. I don't want to guarantee they're going to be available at the show just in case they pre-sell out, but mm-hmm. they may. Okay. Wonderful. We're also going to look for banquet tickets. <laughs> we'll see. Maybe we can find it. Maybe we can't. We'll see. Now, so I want to move into the Ohio National Poultry Show itself. Sure. <laughs> fun stuff is going to be there for everyone that's going to come. I mean, so I've worked just a little bit with Clell and his crew on what's going to be happening there. I know they put together the largest catalog a poultry show has ever seen in color for this year. I want to say it's 51 pages. You can find it online. It's absolutely wow. beautiful. But I know they usually have an egg show. The juniors have what's called showmanship. I don't know if your your members are familiar with showmanship. So there's a big showmanship competition that's going to be happening there. They're going to have a huge variety of poultry-related vendors at this show. So side note about me, I'm a marketing, I work in marketing for Hatching Time, which is an incubation company. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, we know them. We, we sell brooders, I mean, pluckers, everything. So my company's going to have a huge booth there for that. I will not be working with Hatching Time this weekend because I'll be work or that weekend because I'll be with the APA. But there'll be incubation companies. We'll have like poultry supply companies, chicken shirts and products and items and everything you would need for showing chickens and breed club tables. If you wanted to learn about a specific breed, there are so many nationals, I think 20 nationals happening at this show for breed clubs. So breeders, you know, who are trying to win their, their national for the year there, there's just so much that happens at a show like this. There's also a whole separate barn. That's a sale area. So if somebody was looking for birds, there's a whole separate barn for, yeah, there's a whole separate barn for that. That is dangerous. That is very very, dangerous. Do we bring carriers or no? I don't know. We have six hours of a drive and that's now I know secretly why you wouldn't fly and you wanted to drive. That has nothing to do with it. I think it does. (laughs) I think it does. if you're purchasing poultry, I highly recommend having your own carriers or boxes or something. Well, that's Mm -hmm. the whole thing. Like if we want to dissuade ourselves from buying poultry, we will not bring carriers. Uh, there like you go. One or two happen to find their way into the Subaru. I mean, <laughs> we're not buying chicks. We don't have to worry about temperature. A chicken can ride in a carrier. How, Stephanie, how far you are you guys chicken. from the show? We're in Maryland, so six hours. We're, oh, that's not bad at all. My birds, my birds were in the the trailer from Sunday morning about ten o'clock until or yeah, Sunday morning ten o'clock till about Monday night at nine. Totally fine. <laughs> See? See, this one refused to fly, so now I know why. That has nothing to do with it. I swear. Oh, yeah. You want a car because you're going to bring that's, stuff home. You're absolutely going to bring yeah. stuff home. Well, I mean, bringing stuff home did enter my mind. Like, I'm oh, sure there are yeah. things I want to buy. I didn't think about live birds, however. Like, if I find some really gorgeous Nankin hens that I need to bring home and add to my breeding <laughs> program. See, that's how this works. Uh-huh. That's it's what actually you say. Because, uh-huh. it's, it's actually because by the time we went through airport security and mm-hmm. sat on a plane, we could have been more than halfway there. That's what she so, says. Anyway. So... <laughs> So, and you said there's going to be about 10,000 birds being shown. Oh, yes. Yeah. Usually the breakdown between, say, chickens and waterfowl. Um, I believe at this show, like this show's crazy. So there's like a thousand large breed ducks alone at this, like medium heavy ducks alone. I think there's 2,000 large fowl. I know they posted it, so I'm trying to think there's... Give me a second and I'll pull it up right sure. now because I know I know Ohio they posted it. So there is 22 pages of exhibitors. <laughs> oh, wow. <Let's laughs> That's amazing. 
probably the majority bantams. I would expect probably five to six thousand bantams, and then two thousand water or um, large fowl, and then the rest would be waterfowl. It's going to be, and of course, you have your turkeys and your guineas mixed in there as well. There's going to be a tabletop turkey judging. So if if you're not familiar with ever seeing that, so they're going to be doing a tabletop turkey judging, which is how turkeys are supposed to be judged. And then, of course, a ringside runner duck judging. So um, if you've never seen runner ducks judged, I actually just posted a video on the American Poultry Association page from our Canada show of the runner ducks being r- ringside judged. I love this. I'm, I'm losing <laughs> my mind with glee right now. <laughs> it's it's going you to be are, you something, really are. something very special. Ohio is always special. It's always large. But this year is just so like people who've never been who show poultry all the time are are making the trip. Yeah. Amazing. We work with the Livestock Conservancy a lot. And like uh-huh. a year ago, Jeanette Berenger said to us, you need to go to the 150th anniversary. Yeah. Yes, we do. Yes. So <laughs> be like, Jeanette, we'll see you there. Yeah, really. <laughs> So let me see. Did we cover everything with the show? I think we did. Well, then, this is a question that we ask every single one of our guests. And it's not a fair question, but we're asking it anyway. And you're allowed to answer more than one thing. Large (laughs) coachings. No hesitation. I mean, they they are like. The Orpingtons are a very, very close second place to me. They're very special to me. But at the end of the day, the Cochins are my absolute favorite. They're one of my, they were one of my first breeds. My sister and I got our first flock when we graduated from college and Mm -hmm. we had a bunch of different color Cochins and I didn't have them for a while. It was hard when we lost them all. But last year I started with some silver laced. And I have my first set of Cochins this year silver laced silver laced and you know in love with them they came with my three hoodans so that group is very you know that's a gorgeous unique group. Very and black one and white. buff orpington oh, yeah. so it's three silver lace cochins three hoodans and one buff orpington and margo <laughs> the buff orpington looks at everybody like how did i end up here like <laughs> what is this this is very strange but yes they're all super sweet and the cochins they are gorgeous. They're so pretty. They're so pretty. Yeah, they're very, um, mine are very large because I, I raised them as standard. Um, and we, I mean, they're just, they're docile. You usually can walk up to them and pick them up. They're not very flighty. You know, they are difficult to condition. If somebody is looking at showing them, keeping them in condition can prove to be a challenge. They require a lot of space. That's the other thing. All of my breeds require a lot of space. Yep. So a lot of people get can get frustrated with them if they don't have a large area to, to raise them in because they do kind of require that. We just had actually the coach in Western National in Canada and a very good friend of mine won the national and my large coaching was the best large coaching and reserve of the national meet this past weekend. So but, that takes me back to a little a question. Sure. How big are your coachings? Like weight size? You- so I mean they're they're gonna meet standard weight. Uh the males, you know, they're gonna be around 10 pounds and the females are gonna be around eight and eight and a half pounds. That's a big girl. That's yeah. a lot to love. I love <laughs> a lot that. to hug. That's a proper chicken right there. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, they're, they're, lar- that. they're very large. When you come to the show, you're going to see, I would expect that we're going to have well over 100 large coachins at oh, the show. My- Maybe close to 150. Wow. I can't control myself. This one will it'll not be, be able to control herself. It'll be the biggest class of coachins I've ever seen. And I've been showing since since early 2017. Wow. Wow. Nice. Well, Stephanie, this has been so much fun. Stephanie, thank you. Thank you so much for sitting down with us this afternoon. What what a great hour spending with you. We can't wait to meet you in just a few days. It's going to be so much fun. Chicken lady heaven. Yeah. If I can just stop Holly Ann from drooling over here. She (laughs) is. Can't wait. But thank you so much. You're welcome. And we'll see you soon. Okay. Bye-bye. We just want to thank Stephanie and the APA one more time for a really great interview. Lots of good information in there, some good stories. Go to the APA's website, linked in the show notes, and check them out. Okay, are we ready to move on to... Cracking the eggs. Cracking those eggs. Now, this week, I need this because this is a comfort food, a comfort recipe that we're putting out there. And this week for cracking the eggs, we're talking shepherd's pie. 
It's a comfort food. It's a comfort oh, dish. Yes, it is. This is a delicious fall recipe. While traditional shepherd's pie calls for minced or ground lamb, it's essentially stew, lamb stew, with a baked mashed potato crust, you can also use beef and call it cottage pie. I don't know what you would call mine because I used Beyond Burger Plant Ground Meat Crumbles. And when I make it, I use ground turkey. So I threw mushrooms into it for extra yummy gravy. And another nice feature in this version is that we made a red wine gravy, but you can omit the wine and just use more stock in its place if that's what you want to do. I love the taste the red wine gives to it. Oh, yeah. It's good. We also, because we're all about easy, we used instant mashed potatoes. Don't be afraid to use those instant mashed potatoes on a weeknight. Seriously. It's literally dehydrated potato flakes. That's it. You can make them in your dehydrator if you want to. Don't be afraid of the instant mashies. I mean, make the real stuff on holidays, on Sunday family dinners, and make it special. But when you're making like something during the week, go with easier. There is no shame. No if shame you're making it. the shepherd's pie from scratch, a lot of work goes into making the stew and the gravy. Oh, so yeah. Just, just go simple. Now, this recipe uses one egg in the mashed potato topping. You can add two for a richer crust, or you can just go with two egg yolks if you prefer that. It's really rich. It's really rich. You can also, if you're trying to get more flavor into your instant mashies, you can substitute a cup of stock for one of the cups of water. That really increases flavor. Oh, yeah. Okay, so let's look at your ingredients. Now, we're going to need that one box of the instant mashed potatoes, a cup of milk or plant-based milk, two cups of water, and one egg at room temperature or two eggs or two egg yolks. Right. So let's, that's for the topping, basically. Right. So do we want to talk about making the topping first? We don't really need to. I mean, you're essentially... You're mixing it together. Yeah, you're stirring everything (laughs) together. And then you can follow the directions on the package for cooking the instant mashed potatoes. Like you can do it on the stovetop. I just steam them in the microwave. Easy peasy, it's done. Exactly. Okay, so let's go into the ingredients of what's actually in the pie. So we have here that you can use a ground meat of your choice or ground plant-based meat. Holly Ann used Beyond Brand and I use ground turkey. So yeah, it's, it's something pound. you can use. It's a pound. Sometimes they even come in a pound and a half. That's okay. That's yeah, fine, fine too. That's fine. Yep. You're going to need two tablespoons or so of olive oil and onion chopped, two cloves of garlic minced, eight ounces of fresh mushrooms, not from your backyard, sliced. They're from the grocery store. Four large carrots, peeled and chopped, about two cups, a tablespoon of fresh rosemary, minced, one or two sprigs of fresh thyme. I have both in my herb garden, still going really well right now. Me too. One dried bay leaf, as in everything. And don't forget, you're going to take those out before you eat it. That's right. Yes. Two tablespoons of tomato paste, two tablespoons of Worcestershire sauce. Now, the gluten-free alternative is a tablespoon of ketchup with a tablespoon of gluten-free soy sauce or tamari. Okay. Yep. Two tablespoons of flour or gluten-free flour because you're going to be making a gravy and this is going to thicken it up. A half a cup of red wine, one to two cups of veggie broth one teaspoon of salt, more or less to taste how you like it, and two cups of frozen peas. Shepherd's pies are known for having peas. peas if, you don't, if you don't like those, you can put something else in. You, you really know? can. I mean, the world is your oyster. You can leave the mushrooms out and add more meat. You can put different veggies in. I just went classic and it was ridiculously good. So you're going to preheat your oven to 350 in an oven safe pot. Now, my Dutch oven was already occupied. So I just did this in a big skillet on the stove top and then poured it into a baking dish. It's fine. I have this huge skillet. It's not even a skillet. It's like a saucepan, but it's flat uh-huh. and it's massive so that yeah. when you make stuff like this, your pan is big enough. And yeah. I just got it at TJ Maxx. It's mm-hmm. Sometimes they have the best stuff. And sometimes Joe's dad used to always say this. It's not about the job, but it's about the tools you have that make it yeah. easier to do the job, right? So Which if you have the right if, stuff. If you have a big pot that can go from stove to oven, perfect. If not, improvise with what you have. Exactly. So you're going to brown the ground meat in your pot, breaking it up as it cooks. You're not going to cook it to death. You're just going to brown it, get it mostly cooked. 
remove it from the pot. I uh, use a slotted spoon and set it aside to drain. Then you can pour off some or all of the fat in the pan and add olive oil if necessary. Put the pot back over medium heat, add the onion, saute until it's starting to soften. Then you add the mushrooms, carrots, garlic, bay leaf, the whole thyme sprigs, and the minced rosemary. And you're going to saute, stirring occasionally, until the carrots have started to soften. Now you're going to go for your gravy. So you're going to add the tomato paste, the Worcestershire, and the flour to the pot and stir it. Or the gluten-free alternative. So you're going to stir the tomato paste, the Worcestershire, the flour. You're going to pour in the red wine, if you're using, or stock. Deglaze and also pepper. drink some. Drink some, too. I was drinking it. Let the wine cook down for a few minutes to concentrate it to get rid of some of the alcohol. You're going to slowly add the broth, stirring it in until your gravy starts to form. Add your salt if necessary. And then you're going to simmer it over low heat for a couple of minutes until the gravy starts to thicken. By this point, it smells so good. It is unbelievable. You're going to remove the thyme stems and the bay leaf because nobody wants to bite into that. No, you always remove those bay leaves from your recipes and the thyme stems. Definitely. Then you're going to add your peas and the cooked meat and stir to mix them into the stew. You're going to grab those mashed potatoes. You're going to plop them on top and spread carefully. Put them in the oven and bake them for around 20 minutes or so. You're going to see the potatoes starting to brown a little bit. Right. That's your cue to take them out. Let me tell you, this is so good, especially when it's getting cold. I love this dish. It's not really even hard. You're just browning meat, putting everything in and making a gravy and then putting it in a bowl and putting the mashed potatoes on top and browning it. And you know what? Don't kill yourself to make real mashed potatoes during the week. Just make the instant. Make it easy. I mean, it's a nice, warm, home-cooked comfort meal for your family. If it's you great. Buy, if you want to buy chopped onions and chopped carrots or frozen carrots, we're not going to judge you. Get whatever you need to make it easy. Exactly. It's so good. Okay. So try it. You might like it. Send us pictures. We want to see it. Shepherd's pie is a beautiful dish. So send them on over and we'll give you a story. Are you ready to move on to retail therapy? Retail therapy. Yeah. yeah. Okay. This week's retail therapy, we're talking vintage and we're talking Libby's Chicken Glassware Vintage. Yeah, this is an old company. The Libby Glass Company started out in Massachusetts in 1818. It's still going strong. And they were known as the New England Glass Company. Wait, is Libby still going strong? Yes, I'll tell you That's all what about I it. thought. I yeah. thought Libby was still going strong. So the New England Glass Company, their first iteration, ran for just over 60 years when a father and son duo, William and Edward Libby, took over. When William died, Edward took full control of the business, and in 1888, he moved the business to Toledo, Ohio. So many companies moved to Ohio. Have you noticed that? In 1892, Edward changed the name to the Libby Glass Company. And up until 1920, the company's main product was brilliant cut glass. That's what they made, and they made it well. Right. Throughout the 20th century, Libby Glass was really a front runner in both the mechanization of glass production, and in design and sales. They really exploded in popularity in 1966 when they released their golden foliage glassware pattern, which is the largest selling decorated glassware pattern. And we have some. Yeah, and they came in the caddy the way you love. I love glasses in a caddy. Yeah, yeah. Now, Libby interests us because they created a surprising amount of chicken themed glassware and a fair share of ducks as well. Poultry, they loved it. Now, if you can, go Google it and just have fun. I mean, they produced everything from water and wine carafes and tumblers to whiskey and martini glasses. And we especially love their mid-century modern offerings. That's our favorite. Everybody knows we are all about mid-century modern. It's that time frame that we love. But like I was saying, Libby's still out there creating today, but they're one of those companies that's the best of both worlds that you can get new and vintage. Yeah. I love those types of companies that are still going strong. And the thing about Libby is 
mid-century, a lot of their glasses came in caddies, which I love to entertain with. I feel like there's nothing else that seems so special when you come into a house to have lunch with your friend where the glasses are in a caddy. I love the way it looks. It looks really pretty. They're easier to store. Everything about it's really fun. You pull them out, but it gives everything a little bit more formal look without doing it. I even have yellow brick road Libby glasses. I believe yeah. that they're Libby too in the caddy, but the caddies are amazing. I love them. And Libby had a ton of them. If you like the kind of cutesy country stuff that was in style through the 80s and 90s, Libby has got some really good 80s kitsch, like ducks with blue bows around their necks, geese. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's a ton of that out there, too. They also did in the 80s, I think the 70s and 80s, they did a lot of like pitcher and juice glass sets and carafe and juice wear sets. Those are really nice, too. I think Alyssa gave me the carafe for That's Libby, too. The little juice glasses with the chickens and the carafe. That's love. Yeah, it's like a plaid pattern and it has roosters on it. Yep. Love it. Love it. Yeah. So it's the best. Go check out Libby. Now, before we go today, I want to give a shout out to Carla. Carla, who listens to us all the time, we want you to feel better really, really soon. And we're thinking about you. We are. We love you, Carla. Yes, we love you, Carla. Okay, so should we tell everybody what we're going to be talking about next week? Next week, we are spotlighting one of the most popular breeds ever, the Americana. Oh, yes. Next week for our main topic, we're going to be talking to Mark and Twain from Neutrina. We'll be discussing nutrition and the effect of fading day length on your chicken's laying. We welcome those guys back to the table. They're so much fun. Oh, cracking the eggs looks amazing. Sage pumpkin drop biscuits. Yes, we brainstormed, didn't we? Yes, Just we did. Just time for Thanksgiving. And for retail therapy, we're going to be talking about the offerings over at Bantam Roasters. Because their coffee is just amazing. And they got lots of other stuff, too. Mm-hmm. You got to check them out. Okay, so what should we tell everyone to do until next week? Hug your chickens. Every day and kiss them, too. We'll talk to you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. If you'd like to see more of us, please follow us on Instagram at Coffee with the Chicken Ladies. If you'd like to help us grow the podcast, please leave us a written review on Apple Podcasts. If you'd like to become a patron of the show, please visit our Patreon page patreon.com slash coffee with the chicken ladies. Thanks for listening.